43 of Revelation, and we're covering today the three angels and the wide press of wrath. Revelation 14, verse 6 to verse 20, okay? Revelation 14, and the first slide has 6 to 12, the second slide has 13 to 20. The three angels. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead, having the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He spoke with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. A second angel followed, saying, It has fallen, Babylon the great has fallen, who made all nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. And a third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, or anyone who receives the mark of his name. This demands the perseverance of the saints who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. Verse 13, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, the dead who die in the Lord from now on are blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, let them rest from their labors, for their works follow them. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and one like the Son of Man was seated on the cloud with a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the sanctuary, crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come since the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then another angel who also had a sharp sickle came out of the sanctuary in heaven. Yet another angel who had authority over fire came from the altar and called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp, sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vineyard because its grapes have ripened. So the angel swung his sickle toward the earth and gathered the grapes from the earth's vineyard. And he threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. Then the press was trampled outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press up to the horses' bridles for about 180 miles. So, I'm at slide number three. Let's keep in mind as we move forward that these chapters, as we talked about last week, chapters 12 to 14 represent a description of the past, which is chapter 12, the present, which is chapter 13, and the future, which is chapter 14. Okay? So a quick review of last week. Um, and before we even do that... Do we have any questions about last week? Anything that that came up afterwards that you might want to ask about or talk about? Because that might be more fruitful. No, I'm okay. 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 Cool. And you good too, Steve? wrong with the microphone. I, 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 no good. Okay. Okay. So we're good with 144,000. One of the things that I did not mention last week on Sunday, and I just want to touch on this really quickly, was that I left out for some reason verses 2 and 3, and I don't know where that went. 
But the when we get in our minds the image of uh, harps and clouds and stuff of heaven, yes, there are harps mentioned, and they're mentioned here in chapter 14, but it's not what we have understood it to be, okay? Chapter 14, verses 2 and 3 say, I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumblings of loud thunder. The sound I heard was also like harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Now, if you look at this, you, you see a couple of things. Number one, a sound like cascading waters and the rumbling of loud thunder has to symbolize strength and volume. Literal volume and strength. Like It's like the sound of a waterfall. A waterfall and thunder mixed together. Okay? And it's also harpists playing on their harps is speaking to both musicality but also joy and rejoicing. So you have strength power and rejoicing all in those two verses. You, it's also a tumultuous sound. How do we know that? Okay, We know that because when we look at Psalm 137, we see this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Then we hung up our lyres, our harps, it's actually the same word, on the poplar trees, for our captors there asked us for song and our tormentors for rejoicing. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song on foreign soil? John is pointing to that. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Who is he talking about? And again, it can't just be a literal 144,000 people. This is the entire body of believers singing a song that no one can sing but us. Why? Because no one else has been redeemed but us. Not the elders, not the four living creatures, not the angels. The only people, the only ones who can sing this song are those of us who have been redeemed from the earth. That makes sense. Okay, this is this is your song. <laughs> this is my song. You know, that, that, that old hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, what's the chorus? This is my story, this is my song. That's, that's what it is, the song that only the people of God, only the redeemed can sing. And we'll have the exact opposite situation than Israel did when it was taken into captivity. They could no longer sing the songs of rejoicing, the songs of, of joy, because they were in captivity. Okay? So, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I, for some reason I left that out last week. I don't know why. Um, I might find a way to edit it into the slideshow for next for last week. I don't know yet, but that that's that. We talked last week about verse four and keeping virginity and following the Lamb wherever he goes. And that this does not mean that every one of the people of God is a virgin. But it does mean that we're looking at how the Old Testament describes idolatry, the worship of God. And it is described in sexual terms. Jeremiah does that. Hosea does that. Ezekiel does that. And so we put a couple of examples last week um, where it's very clear, especially in Jeremiah 3, 6 to 9, that he's talking about idol worship and false religion, especially when you get to how Judah was not afraid 
but also went and prostituted herself. Indifferent to her prostitution, she defiled the land and committed the adultery with stones and trees. That's very graphic language, okay? But it also points out that idolaters carve their gods out of wood and stone. They carve gods and then they worship them. And that's what's being discussed here. Hosea makes it clear, my people consult their wooden idols and their divining rods inform them, for a spirit of promiscuity leads them astray. They act promiscuously in disobedience to their God. They sacrifice on the mountaintops, and they burn offerings on the hills, and under oaks, poplars, terebinths, because their shade is pleasant. And so your daughters act promiscuously, and your daughters-in-law commit adultery. One of the themes that I didn't mention here is the idea of idolatry cutting you off from your future. Okay? And we're going to see that today when we, we look at another passage of Scripture. But idolatry, false religion, cuts you off from your future. Look at what he says. Your daughters act promiscuously. Your daughters-in-law commit adultery. That is, that is the ultimate shame for the Jew, to have a daughter who is whoring, or, or your son marry a whore or a prostitute. And yet that is exactly what God is saying is happening to the people because of their idolatry. Hosea 9.1, Israel, do not rejoice jubilantly as the nations do, for you have acted promiscuously, leaving your God. You have loved the wages of a prostitute on every grain threshing floor. Okay? Every place you could, <coughs> excuse me, every place you could, you acted promiscuously, and God is going to punish you for that. The first images, of course, that jumped up to me, aside from what the people of God do, were how the, the pagans of today, the, the number of false crucifixions that I saw during Gay Pride Month, especially during these parades, where naked women tied to crosses and men making out with men who were tied to crosses and all kinds of things like that, as if we are going to show Christ that we know better than he does. There, there is, as much as that is out front and visible and meant to shock, the reality is that within the body of Christ, there are a great number of people who are doing the exact same thing, only in a different way. We have set up idols for ourselves, and we worship those idols, and yet we are the people of God. Okay? There, there is something that we have to take into consideration. Because Hosea is talking to God's people. He's not talking to the heathen. Jeremiah is talking to God's people. He's not talking to the heathen. He is talking to the people who should know better because they are in covenant relationship with God. Right? All right, so we're moving forward. When Revelation speaks of no lie being found in their mouth, does that mean that all they did was speak the truth all the time? No, it does not. John is making reference to the fact that we, they, have maintained their faith. Okay? And he says so in 1 John chapter 2. Verse 22 says, Who is the liar if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? So what is the lie? denying the truth of Christ. And so for no lie to be found in their mouths means that they have not denied the truth of Christ. Why, why do we know that? Verse 23 of 1 John 2, no one who denies the Son can have the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. What you have heard from the beginning must remain in you. 
If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he himself made to us. And what is that promise? Eternal life. So when we see Revelation 14, 5, no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. That is what he is talking about. So the people, this 144,000, which we now know to be the entire body of believers, they have not forsaken Christ. They have not worshipped other gods. Hence, they are counted as virgin and blameless. All right, are we cool? Yeah. All right. We talked last week about providential rule, the difference between a seal and a mark. A seal is the symbol of the sovereign. What is sealed carries the sovereign's authority and where applicable, the protection. In other words, the protection of the crown, the, the authority of the crown goes wherever the seal is. And that should embolden and encourage us because we are walking around with the authority and the protection of the King of Kings. So we do not need to be afraid of the things that will come at us from those who carry the mark. The seal overwhelms the mark every time. While a mark is an identifier and it does hold some limited authority in certain areas, it doesn't carry the authority of a seal. And it is superseded by the seal. Okay? Some are marked, some are sealed. If we believe that the earth is the Lord's and its fullness, and everything that dwells therein, as the psalmist says, then we understand that those who are marked with the mark of the beast are only temporarily property of the beast. Because everything is God's. And those of us who are sealed are sealed forever with him. Okay, so that means in practical terms for us right now as believers in this environment, that in practical terms, the seal can protect you from the wrath of the beast, but the mark cannot protect you from the wrath of the Lord. And we're going to see that in this chapter, this passage as we talk about the grapes being processed. So this week, starting at chapter... 14 verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead, having the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He spoke with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. When I read that, a couple of weeks ago, the first thing that popped into my head was Joshua chapter 7. Especially the choosing of Achan after, remember, there is sin in the camp. They are told that they are not supposed to take anything during the destruction <clears throat> of Jericho. Mm -hmm. But somebody does. And so when they go to AI, they are defeated. Joshua chapter 7, verses 16 to 20. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel near by their tribes. In other words, he went one by one through the 12 tribes until he got to Judah. And Judah was selected. And then he selected Judah by family. He brought near the family of Judah, and he took the family of Zerah, the Zerahites. And then the Zerahites came one by one, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And then Zabdi brought his household and his grandson, Achan, who was the son of Carmi. He was taken. And Joshua said to him, listen, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to Jehovah, the God of Israel, and make confession to him. And tell me now what you've done. Hide it not from me. 
So Achan confesses, right? He confesses that he brought some things home from Jericho during the battle and that he dug a hole in his, in his tent and hid them and his family was in on it. They all knew what was going on and as a result, everyone is killed, right? But notice that Joshua says to him, give glory to God. Confess, give glory to God. This angel is saying to the inhabitants of the earth, which is not us, right? He's saying to the inhabitants of the earth, right before the judgment begins, fear God and give him glory. Because the hour of his judgment has come. So even though there comes a time where repentance is no longer possible, confession still will be made, even as judgment follows. You're not going to be able to say you didn't know. You're not going to be able to say I had no clue. You're not going to be able to say no one told me. Because in the presence of a holy and righteous God, in that moment when everything is laid bare and everything is exposed, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, right? That's what's going to happen. The Lordship of Christ is going to be confessed. The glory of God is going to be given to God as is his due by everyone. Because everyone will believe. For most, that belief will come too late. Because repentance will no longer be possible. Okay. Achan confessed, and Achan may have been repentant, but he was not granted repentance. Verse 8, the second angel followed, saying, It has fallen, Babylon the great has fallen who made all nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. Knowing what we know about this, what is being called sexual immorality here? Idolatry. Yep. Exactly. So then we have to figure out who or what is being called Babylon here, right? The Greek form of Babel, Semitic form Babylu, meaning the gate of God, in the Assyrian tablets it means the city of the dispersion of the tribes. Okay, and I'm reading from the Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Um, and it talks a little bit about what Babylon was geographically and historically. But what I want to focus on for us comes from Vine's Dictionary of the Bible. The word drink here, it has fallen, Babylon the Great has fallen, who made all nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality. According to Vine's Dictionary of the Bible, the word drink here is the word potizo, which is used here figuratively with reference to teaching. Okay? It's the same way that Paul uses this word in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says, I fed you with milk of spiritual watering by the teaching of the word of God. Right? It is the same word for being provided and being satisfied by the power and blessing of the spirit. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 12. And it speaks to partaking. So you have feeding, being satisfied, 
being provided for you, and you have partaking. All of those words, this word carries that connotation. And so Babylon the Great has fed, has caused the nations to partake, has provided for, has satisfied the nations of the world with, as Vine says, paganism with details of the Christian faith. In other words, there's just enough truth mixed in to the lie to cause people to partake and to perish. Whether it is as a Muslim friend of mine um, or Muslim acquaintance of mine, at one point I thought he was a friend, this was years ago, he's an acquaintance, he said this week, that Christianity, Islam, and Judaism are all the same because they all worship the same God, which is the common mantra that is being recited because they make claims to monotheism and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But any side-by-side -side comparison of Allah and Yahweh are very clearly disparate. They don't have the same personality. They don't have the same attributes. They don't act the same way. They don't say the same things, right? But there's just enough presentation to confuse. A sister asked me this week about Seventh-day Adventism because she had had a meeting with a Seventh-day Adventist sister and just had some questions about the finer points of some of the doctrinal positions. Then she asked me, were Seventh-day Adventism and Mormonism similar? And I had to take her through the facts that Mormonism, while it claims to be Christianity, and we all know this, clearly is not, because the Elohim of Mormonism used to be a man. Whereas Yahweh has no beginning. And let's just start there. And then a whole plethora of things develop which point to huge doctrinal and positional errors in Mormonism, which makes it clear this is not Christianity. And yet, it has some things which are appealing, right? Some major so-called pastor this week is having Glenn Beck at his church to preach this week. I can't remember who it is, but it's some major evangelical, but he's having Glenn Beck at his church to preach this week. I'm like, we haven't figured this out yet. But there are things that are close enough. You know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the, the song from Mary Poppins, right? A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. All it takes is just a little bit of truth to make the lie palatable enough for you to swallow. And this is why we have to know what saith the Lord. So that we are not drinking the wine of Babylon's immorality, which brings the wrath of God. Let's look at Genesis 11, verses 1 to 9. It's on the next slide, so if one of you brothers would pick that up, that would be appreciated. Genesis 11, 1 to 9. At one time, the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another speak. So from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. 
Therefore, its name is called Babylon, for there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Keep going, Steve. Second Kings 20, 16 to 18. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of Jehovah. Behold, the day come that all that is in thy house, at which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, save. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, whom thou shalt get, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Babylon, powerful, clearly, because the Lord says, there's nothing if these people set their minds to it that they can't accomplish. And yet it's prideful. Come, let's make a name for ourselves. Sinful, because it is seeking to replace God. Destructive. Because in causing people to look away from God, right? What happens as a result? Confusion. And then later, we see Babylon used for destruction in the same way that we talked about earlier in terms of taking one's legacy away, taking one's strength away. If your sons are going to be carried away and be eunuchs. And what's interesting here is how verse 18 is worded. That word issue is the same Hebrew word that's describing ejaculation. Okay? When I think it's Ezekiel that talks about how um, Israel and Judah have perverted themselves with lovers whose issue is as powerful as stallions and whose members are the size of horses, right? So that word that's being used there. Your sons shall issue from you. In other words, out of your loins, it's a, it's a very sexual term, your sons shall come and you'll beget them, but they will be taken away and they will be made eunuchs. In those days when you were made a eunuch, it does not mean that you just were not allowed to have sex. It means that your testicles were removed. Mm-hmm. So look at the paradox. You stay with God and you have seed which reproduces. You step away from God and that which you produce will have no further generations. That's the worst thing you could say to a Jewish man. Oh, apropos for today. Indeed. Indeed. And ultimately, that which cannot reproduce is destroyed. Right? It cannot further itself. Yeah. Verse 9 to 12. The third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger. Now, right before that, we had the wine of sexual immorality. And now, the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength in the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image or anyone who receives the mark of his name. This demands the perseverance of the saints, who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. So I got to thinking, what cup is this? And the Holy Spirit took me to Matthew chapter 26. 
And Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The cup of God's anger, which is filled with the wine of God's wrath, is the cup that Jesus is speaking about. And because he drank from that cup, we can drink from the other cup that is mentioned in Matthew 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. We do not have to drink the wine of God's wrath, which is mixed full strength into the cup of his anger, because Jesus did that for us. Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. That is our cup. For this is my blood. And that's what busted my face today. Mm. Yeah. The son of God's soul swallowed up in his soul. Yes, sir. And people still ask me why. Well, oh, anyway, thank you yeah. for that. Next slide. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, the dead who die in the Lord from now on are blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, let them rest from their labors, for their works follow them. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and there was one <clears throat> like the Son of Man, seated on the cloud with a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the sanctuary, crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come, since the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's interesting that when Jesus is walking the earth, he's telling his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he's talking about the people who would hear the gospel and come. But this isn't that. This is another harvest altogether. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then another angel who had also a sharp sickle came out of the sanctuary in heaven. Yet another angel who had authority over fire came from the altar and called out with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vineyard. Because its grapes have ripened. So the angel swung his sickle toward the earth and gathered the grapes from the earth's vineyard and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Have mercy. Then the press was trampled outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press up to the horses' bridles for about 180 miles. The, the imagery here is, is just, 
I mean, first of all, you know that a horse's bridle is about five and a half feet up, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about, you know, just an image here because we're talking about, again, symbols. 180 miles, a lake of blood that is 180 miles around and five feet deep, five and a half feet deep. I can't even. But let's examine this, okay? Let's look at verse 13. Right, the dead who die in the Lord from now on are blessed. Yes, says the Spirit, let them rest from their labors, for their works follow them. G.K. Beale says, now an exhortation is given to true saints to persevere through temporary suffering. And he's talking about verse 11. <clears throat> through temporary suffering inflicted on them because of their loyalty to Christ so that they might avoid the eternal consequences of loyalty to the beast. I thought that was a, a good parallel. Temporary suffering. If you're loyal to Christ, there is temporary suffering. If you're loyal to the beast, there are eternal consequences. There is eternal consequence for those who follow the beast. There is eternal reward. Okay? If believers persevere even in the face of death, they will be blessed. This includes believers who die a martyr's death or from natural causes. The emphasis is on those dying in the Lord, not on the precise manner of death. Like martyrs, those dying from other causes will also receive the blessing because they likewise, in their own ways, are resisting the pressures to conform to idolatry. And that goes right in line with what we were saying before. Either the first beast of persecution will attack you or the second beast right, of deception will attack you. And in either case, you have to stand firm. You have to be able to resist. Notice how Revelation 14, 14 to 19 is parallel to this passage in Joel. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's Joel 3, 12 to 14. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit down to judge all the surrounding nations. Swing the sickle, because the harvest is ripe. Come and trample the grapes, because the wine press is full. The wine vats overflow, because the wickedness of the nations is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So this is imagery that John has, which is very much biblical, very much Old Testament, and his early readers would have or should have identified that that's imagery from the prophet Joel. The gathering, the sickle, the harvesting, the wine press, the trampling down of the wicked, because God is now sitting in judgment. And you know that he's talking about people because notice one second they're called grapes, but in another, what comes out of the wine press is not juice, it is blood. That's interesting. That's pretty much all that I have for tonight.